Oh, thank you. Um, I'm actually really glad to follow on here. I think there are some related themes that I'll explore, um, as well as some, some quite different ones. So I'm going to focus today on how um, what I'm sort of a, a group I'm classifying as data scientists broadly, um, uh, researchers who are using uh, digital data about people um, and how they might increase the trustworthiness of their research. Um, so, you know, we've been ta sort of talking about trust and the different elements of trust and trust is funny, right? Because it has both these public facing messaging kind of pieces to it. What do people believe? What, how do we tell them about what we're doing? But it also has the sort of ethical component to it being trustworthy. Um, and I don't actually know much about the messaging piece and the public trust piece. Um, that's not my expertise. My expertise is in being trustworthy in the ethics of the research we do um, and how uh, that can be an important component of public trust in science. Um, so I'm going to uh, speak about sort of increasing trustworthiness in um, research and also increasingly in technology development, in AI development that relies on rich information generated about people through digital devices and digital interactions. All right, um, well, just a little map of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start by talking about what I mean by uh, digital data use um, and particularly in data science and AI development and why I think there are trust problems in this area. Um, I'll talk a bit more about why the existing infrastructures we've built, both in the U.S. and internationally, for public trust in research ethics, um, largely based on the Belmont Report um, in the 1970s, and then in the U.S. facilitated by IRBs, in Europe by REBs. They work a bit differently, but similar principles at play in both places. Um, I think that they currently create a helpful but kind of orthogonal infrastructure for guiding research and development that relies on large collections of human and uh, digital data. Um, and then I'll introduce how our research team has used both empirical and theoretical research in this space to propose interventions um, that would support trustworthy digital data reuse based on excavating two things that are too often paved over in data science and in AI research, people's awareness of data use and re reuse and attention to power relationships in the use of that data. All right, I don't I think I need to tell this audience that uh, digital data has become a goldmine for health research, for social science research, for research on politics. Um, and you know, using digital data to understand people, as well as to train systems to make predictions or decisions for and about people. Um, and as you're also likely aware of, this is the conversation of the uh, entire uh, conference. Um, that um, these new kinds of data collection methods also have raised new questions about ethics and participation in this sort of research. Um, so some of you might remember um, an early day, an early bellwether of ethical issues in this space. Uh, the Fuhrer, the public Fuhrer set off by Facebook's 2014 emotional contagion study with Cornell University researchers. For those that don't remember, um, Facebook uh, uh, cooperated with academic researchers to um, do experiments on people's timelines. Um, and so they would experiment with the emotional valence of posts in those timelines and see whether people posted more or less positive uh, posts based on what they were seeing, if they were seeing more or less positive um, valence, emotional valence. Um, and it, it found sort of a small effect size. Um, but what created the fear was that consent was not a part of this experiment. Facebook was simply experimenting uh, on, on, um, on its users, um, which of course it does all the time, but it was something about the collaboration with academics and the publishing, the, the science of it, that really set people off. Um, and analysis by my colleague, Casey Fiesler, and co-authors examined the public backlash to this study. We were really interested in, in why this instance, like what was it that troubled people? Um, and so they studied public uh, comments on media articles about the about the study. Um, and in particular, Facebook users objected to the feeling of living in a lab, of being observed for science while online. Um, and mistrust of research uses of online data is broader than just Facebook. Um, a survey of Twitter users by Fiesler and Proferis found that a majority of users are surprised that tweets are found are used in research um, and feel that informed consent should be necessary. If you know anything about social science research on Twitter, this is a surprising finding. Social scientists use Twitter all the time uh, to do research, um, uh, not necessarily with, with consent. It's considered public data. 
Um, respondents did express willingness to participate in research, but it depended on the purpose, the team, and the institution conducting it, and the mechanics of that research. Um, and a very recent survey of over a thousand social media users by Libby Hemphill at the University of Michigan and her colleagues showed that participants find social media data to be moderately sensitive um, and preserving of similar protections to medical records. Um, and finally, studies indicate that trust issues in digital data research may be even larger within marginalized communities. And importantly, this research backlash is occurring at the same time as a more general backlash against the platforms that create the data at the heart of much data science and uh, AI development. Much of the data that is used in big data research and in development was commercial data first, streaming from platforms and smart devices and other online interactions. And increasingly, research uses of such data have coincided with the growth in news headlines and podcast episodes and a major motion picture, it's, or it's really a Netflix documentary, about what are increasingly viewed as the ethical failings of big tech. The tech industry broadly has struggled during this time with whether and how to talk about its politics, its values, its social obligations, and its role in controlling this increasingly pervasive data about all of us. And finally, as artificial intelligence has begun to blur the line between research and data collection and product development, we continue to struggle with understanding trustworthy ways to use digital data, not only to understand phenomena or uh, build new knowledge, but to build tools that can make predictions or decisions based on that data. So the media, for instance, has covered issues like bias in medical prediction systems, um, there, uh, the Hopkins Bloomberg article I have here used an example of a machine learning system that was trained to detect knee pain levels due to osteoarthritis using image processing. And it worked in the United States, but only for white people. In an NPR, the NPR article I have here leads with a 2019 study from science that was that found an algorithm it was used to predict healthcare needs was similarly blind, uh, biased against Black Americans. Uh, Bias data used to train AI systems becomes biased decision making. Okay, so what do we do about this? What should the people who rely on digital data to do their research or to make new tools do in the face of bias challenges and mistrust and uncertainty? So with colleagues, I've been part of the Pervade project. Um, this was originally a five-year grant-funded project uh, funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Because of COVID, it became more like a seven-year project. So we've been working on this for a long time. Um, and at the heart of our project has been the question of trust in data use and trustworthy practices for data, digital data reuse. Um, and so in longer talks, I have like a long section here on the studies we did and what we found, but I am just gonna sort of throw some citations at you here because I don't have time to go into the, all of the empirical and theoretical work that we conducted. But over these seven years, um, we conducted both a series of empirical and theoretical inquiries. Um, and a broad introduction to what we found was that most of the approaches that had been already developed for traditional research ethics weren't sufficient for the emerging paradigm of research with big digital data sets. Study after study showed that people expect researchers to gain consent for online data use, but that they also might be willing to share data depending on research purposes and mechanics as long as they're aware of that data and that research. Um, and this makes sense. These norms, these expectations are based on 50 plus years of research ethics that rely on consent as a fundamental expression of respect for persons. Um, unfortunately, it's not an expectation that's well suited for the reality of online data research. And we also learned um, uh, during this research from an increasingly pre prevalent form um, of theoretical research demonstrating that power relationships really influence the ethics of online data research. Um, and there's some really good emerging research about the ways that power and social relationships matter to how you use online data. So that led us to sort of two frameworks that we thought were useful for thinking through online data. Um, and again, this is just a really brief introduction to both of these. Um, I, could, I could talk for a long time about both of them, but the first is thinking about awareness. Um, and consent is of course a form of awareness, but maybe not the only form of awareness. Um, and so we think to think about what awareness might look like in data science, we found it helpful to start from the idea of the data itself. 
by mapping data collected or data use from digital devices and interactions on two spectra. This is a heuristic for thinking about where data come from that can help reason about what people's reasonable expectations about how that data will be used. Okay, so first people's data gets collected somewhere along a continuum of private to public. And I want to say right now that I'm talking about people's perceptions of public and private. As we know, very little data is truly private anymore, um, and that that definition of private actually is very complicated. But um, what I'm talking about is sort of people's perceptions of their audience, um, whether or not they are creating something for a small audience or a large audience. Um, so private data might get collected with an implicit or explicit ex expectation of privacy or of a small audience, especially for things like medical records or financial documents. Um, and yet, as we know, this data may in fact end up in data sets for one research purpose or another. Public information gets collected for research too. Um, Twitter feeds, census data, likes on a YouTube video are all public data. They're created for a large audience. Second, I think it's important to consider that data can be more or less intentionally created. That's the up or down axis here. Um, and again, I'm talking about uh, individual sense of creating their of their intention and in creating data. Um, you know, data creation is always intentional for someone, right? Somebody's collecting that data. Uh, but what I'm talking about is the person creating the data and whether or not they intend to create data. So um, when I press send on a tweet, I know I'm intending to put something out there in the world just as I know when I'm liking a video or filling out a survey form. Um, but of course, I also contribute unintentionally to data sets all the time. I don't intend to create a log of my location every time I open a Google product on my phone, but I do. Uh, I also don't know when my keystrokes are being automatically logged uh, on a web form or if my IP address is being collected by Netflix, but these data are uh, sometimes being automatically collected. So there are shades of gray for all of these forms of data. Um, and uh, we've sort of labeled them with tags depending on where they fall so that researchers have a heuristic to think about. So broadcast data might be those tweets, right? I mean to create them and I am um, meaning to send them to a large audience and the ethics of using uh, tweets in research. Uh, therefore, you know, I, I have a certain set of expectations around the publicness of, and the audience for that data. Um, on the very other extreme, we have espionage data, and we use a loaded word for that on purpose. Um, these are things that I didn't intend to create and that are created in private settings. So this is, um, you know, the, the data on my, that my phone, the telemetry data on my phone um, about when I fall asleep at night, right? Like my phone knows when I go to bed because I stopped looking at it for eight hours. Um, I didn't intend to create that. And it's created in my, that's like a, in my home, right? I don't, I don't intend that to have an audience. That's espionage data. Um, and thinking about data this way gives research scientists and gives data scientists some ways of thinking about some of the objections and or expectations that people might have about the form of data that they are using in their work. Um, the next uh, sort of big theoretical principle um, that we, that the Pervade group um, really worked through was thinking about or reflecting about power in, uh, and how to think about power in data science. Um, thinking about data sources, and again, that idea of where the data comes from can also help us think about principles of justice. Does the data come from a particularly vulnerable population? Is it more likely to produce errors when it's applied to a population that has been historically harmed by such errors? Like in the um, medical examples that we shared earlier, that I shared earlier. Is it more likely, uh, does it help, does the data help a less vulnerable population at the expense of a more vulnerable one? Does the research design, this gets into citizen science a bit and participatory research, does the research design include members of the population group it's targeted at helping? particularly in the US, but also in non-US contexts, data-driven technological developments have been designed for the targeted oppression of minorities and have failed to live up to liberatory promises. And researchers need to grapple with that history um, and those relationships if they are truly going to use data for public good. Um, and so I think data scientists need to consider whether it's appropriate to make members of a given community or population more vulnerable by creating new forms of data about them or through secondary uses of that data. Um, so this consideration might involve spending time physically or virtually in a community to understand their norms before harvesting all of their data, 
collaborating with that community to serve their needs, um, working with gatekeepers in that community to understand specific harms that might come to a community through research. For example, something we see a lot of is um, communities concerned about amplifying content beyond its intended audience. Um, and we think that pervasive data research should emphasize a standard that's drawn from political representation movements and disability activism, the idea of nothing about us without us. Using pervasive data to study populations or make automated decisions about them without significant representation from those communities raises a risking, it risks uh, racing standpoints and lived experiences of the people behind that data. Um, so, you know, if we think that the answer to is, uh, is data collection trustworthy, is it ethical, is always, it depends, it depends on your data, it depends on your power relationships. We realize that this is a very hard thing for researchers to navigate. Um, and so we started thinking about how we could help data users walk through the various variables that matter um, and how those might affect their individual projects. Um, so to meet this challenge and hopefully be helpful to diverse data use communities, we are designing and testing um, what we're calling the Pervade Decision Support Tool, uh, which is not a very catchy name. We are in the market for catchier names. Um, and the vision of this tool is as a resource, not a governance tool. Um, it recommends actions and videos and readings. This very much comes out of our role as educators, right? Not as, uh, you know, we're not in charge of anything. Um, and we see it as a supplement to other kinds of research ethics education um, courses and online trainings, things like that. Uh, the tool is freely available at the Pervade website, and I have a link at the end. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit about its uh, how we've set it up and its features. The, the goal of the tool is to encourage reflexive product uh, project design and research project design to inspire trust or for trustworthiness. It, the tool walks users through reflexivity about every part of their project uh, design, prompting places where users might increase the, their engagement with awareness and power. So, for example, in its opening section on project goals, the tool uses quiz questions. It's kind of like a BuzzFeed quiz style to ask users to consider whose interests are represented in their project and whether there are existing disciplinary and codified guidelines that they might draw from. We ask questions about power and representation, prompting users to consider whether you know, they're studying people more or less or with the same sort of social power as them and how they might increase representation on design teams. We also de delve into the contextual expectations embedded in data sources using that data quadrants concept that I introduced earlier, as well as discussions about how the data were acquired um, and the norms of the data collection context. We ask about um, and then provide resources on security and retention best practices, um, on the challenges of analysis, including the challenges of constructing meaningful binaries and categories. This can be really hard in data research. Categories like gender and race are uh, very hard to define and you risk um, uh, erasing perspectives. Um, and uh, the uh, challenges of linking data sets and, and re-identification potential, um, and challenges of making potentially distressing or harmful inferences about data subjects or populations even beyond data subjects. And finally, we close with questions about data sharing, including pointing out challenges around de-identification and balancing open science principles with participant protection. So as people take the questionnaire, they get per question feedback. So each question, um, and you can sort of see the blue pop-ups there, uh, you get a little bit of feedback for each question. And then at the end, you get a prescriptive, uh, sort of a prescription for next steps that uh, that you can, you can t work through um, to help address some of the data ethics issues that may be pertinent to your project. Um, so users may find themselves operating in easy mode, or intermediate mode or hard mode with more or less work to do uh, to work through ethical issues, depending on the details of their data use. Hard mode users aren't being told not to do their project, just that they have a, a lot more work to do to ensure participant awareness and to reflect upon power in their project. Um, 
trail uh, pervade is wrapping up, but I wanted to just end um, today with uh, a new project um, that was very much uh, it has you know its inspiration in this sort of uh, thinking through data ethics in in uh, data science, but really focused on AI. Um, and this is where some of these themes of citizen science and AI that we were talking about uh, in uh, Marissa's uh, uh, presentation start to come through as well. Um, uh, you know, I focus today on ethical data use as sort of one component of trustworthy AI, um, but I want to highlight that there are many, many more pieces that are going to go into thinking through ethical and trustworthy AI development, and that there's lots of room for innovation in the space of practices that would support participatory and, and trustworthy AI. Um, so this is a major uh, motivation of a new um, uh, National Science Foundation and uh, U.S. National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, funded uh, Institute for Trustworthy AI and Law and Society, or TRAILS, we're calling it TRAILS, um, which is a partnership between the University of Maryland, where I'm based, um, George Washington University, and Morgan State University. And I'm excited to say we've just launched this institute, um, and it will have projects focusing on participatory design techniques for AI. So what does it look like to move beyond sort of the ghost work model of just having some people train your, you know, tune your algorithm and instead move towards more participatory forms of model development and data selection. Um, and, you know, what does that look like? Um, methods for developing methods and metrics to represent interests of much more diverse stakeholders in AI development, methods for evaluating trust with diverse populations, and finally, methods for increasing participation in AI governance. So this is all sort of forthcoming work. Um, and uh, with that, I will leave it here and I'm happy to take questions.